Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. This March, Calvin Davis got sick, very sick. He was soon diagnosed with COVID-19, and he ultimately spent 76 days in the hospital and more than 90 days away from home as he battled the coronavirus. For much of that time, he was on a ventilator. Now Calvin is back home, but his battle isn't over. And joining us today to talk about his ongoing recovery and what she's learned from this whole ordeal is his daughter, Melanie Blackshear. Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. So when did you first learn that your father had COVID-19? So I only found out the day he was initially um, admitted to the hospital, and that was on April the 9th. But I had learned since then that he was sick prior to then. He was just unsure whether or not he had the virus. Okay, so he was having symptoms, he was ill, but it wasn't until he was there at the hospital that you were able to get that test and, and get the confirmation. Correct. He actually had the test prior to being admitted, but he never received the results until he was admitted. Okay. So what had his health been like prior to this whole illness beginning for him? Well, from what I can see and from what his primary told us, he was a fairly healthy guy. He had a few underlining conditions, but they were very much under control. And then that all started to change. Do you know how how this uh, journey began for him in terms of the COVID-19 struggle? Yeah, he assumed he had the flu and he would just follow up with his primary and he was taking his medications and resting, but his condition just continued to get worse and deteriorate. Uh, He could no longer walk up the stairs without taking two steps and Mm -hmm. just being overwhelmed and tired. Hmm. And does he have any idea where he was first exposed to it? He has no idea. Hmm. I mean, this is all the way back in March. At that point, the coronavirus was still very new for people even to be worried about. Mm -hmm. Um, And I imagine it it was circulating out there in the community. It sounds like it could have been anywhere. Absolutely. Agreed. So there he is in the hospital. I know a lot of family members have made a difficult choice at that point that they are not going to be able to see their family member um, because they are so worried about catching it themselves. Was that the case for you? Absolutely. But I think we would have taken our chances if we were to be able to go to the hospital to comfort him. Um, I, I just don't see how anybody can heal in a hospital for over 60 days and they're surrounded by people that they're not familiar with um, in strange rooms. How, how do you mentally heal from that? Mm-hmm. So, so I probably would have taken the chances to go see him. So it's a tough situation. I mean, he's there in the hospital. Were you able to get pretty regular reports on what was going on with his condition? We were. The staff was pretty generous about reaching out to us on a daily basis if we didn't contact them first. We were able to speak to physicians and the nurse staff that was caring for him. So we received our daily updates. We really did. And that that helped a lot along with the daily or weekly Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. And you were able to see him on that Zoom call or was this his care team? We were able to see him, Mm. uh, even though he was uh, in a coma or heavily sedated most of the time. So that may not have given you much relief um, seeing him in that condition. It it didn't, but after our first Zoom session, I saw my dad's heartbeat. I saw signs of life. I just saw too many positive signs that were there. And at that point, we were going to give our dad a chance. Mm-hmm. Now, we know any time people end up on ventilators, the outcomes tend to be just really scary, really bad. You must have been just terrified um, that you were going to lose him. Absolutely. Um, We were told within the first week and a half to three weeks that our dad was considered terminal. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was pretty much considered to be a dead man. He would never breathe again on his own. He would always require the use of a ventilator and a trach. Um, His lungs had turned into concrete. They were hard like bricks. And He's now the complete opposite of what we were being told. Boy, that, I mean, that's just such a devastating diagnosis. And and yet, you know, we know here he is. He's been checked out of the hospital. He's there at home. What happened? Do you have any idea what changed that he's now, he was able to leave? He turned this around. 
I, I, I'm going to say it's, it's truly an answered blessing um, for me and my family. I think we called on everything and everybody we could from our ancestors to Jesus to friends and family. And I think we built a prayer wall for protection and we remain faithful. And at the end, God's will be done, whether he was to stay with us or if he was going to be taken home. At what point? And here did, he is. Yeah, here he is. I mean, it's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy for you guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At what point did you road. realize, wow, there's a chance he could actually leave the hospital. He's going to get to go home. You know, I, I think I became my own physician, my own nurse, and I probably would be able to pass the medical board exam now. But I asked so many questions, and the last conversation with a physician at SLU, he told us about all of the great things that was happening to Dad and how he wanted to transfer him to a different hospital. And the only thing he never mentioned was the condition of Dad's lungs. Hmm. So I said, hey, how are the lungs today? And the physician replied, we are not concerned with the lungs. They are doing better. I almost passed out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that seems amazing in light of what they previously told you. And, and they almost mentioned Absol it as an afterthought. <laughs> Absolutely. I almost passed out when they told us. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm clearing my ears out as if I had wax. I did not believe what he just told me because this was the number one problem that we were facing is his lungs were hard as bricks. They were concrete. He would never <laughs> breathe again on his own. He would always require the use of a ventilator. So for him to tell us, oh, we're no longer concerned about the lungs. <laughs> I was dead. I was dead myself at that moment. <laughs> And, and hearing you recount this story today, I can hear just so much joy in your voice. I mean, this must have just been the greatest relief of all time. Oh, God, it, it's truly an answer blessing. It's a humbling experience. It, it, it allows you to, to reset and to refocus even on your own life, not just your dad's, but just put so many other things about life into perspective. Hmm. But, you know, him him going home from the hospital is, you know, well, that is not the end of the story here. Um, not by oh a long shot. God. What was he like when he first got home? Oh, my gosh. Dad, as weak as he is and as horrible as his voice was sounding because his throat muscles are still very, very weak. Mm. He he wanted as much of his personal life to be set back to normalcy. And that's definitely his goal. He had demands from his daily routines to eating and to sleeping. And I guess you can kind of understand that after being in the hospital or away for 96 days. But as the caregiver, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I need help. <laughs> <laughs> then were you able to no. get help? I mean, that's a that's a big burden for somebody to deal with somebody who's been that seriously <laughs> ill, and then also, yes. you know, attending to their needs, getting the food they want, getting everything just oh so. My oh my god! I feel like I have a, a twelve year old that I'm caring for, <laughs> but oh boy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm switching on and off with one other person and I'm still doing 62 hours per week as a caregiver. Wow. That is a massive commitment there. Um, had you oh any uh, training in, in medical or in being a caregiver before this was kind of thrust upon you? No. <laughs> Again, I'm very good. I probably can draw blood. <laughs> I'm telling you, I can take that medical exam board right now. I know so much about medication and feeding tubes and, oh, gosh. We're talking to Melanie Blackshear and her father, Calvin <laughs> Davis, suffered for a very long time with COVID-19. He spent 76 days in the hospital, more than 90 days away from home, also included a stint in a, a rehab center as he battled his way back. Such a great story here. Um, but Melanie, one of the things that has been a, a complication for you is I understand you were furloughed um, from your real job yes. in the middle of this. Uh, that's got to have yes. presented some financial hardships. How have you been able to cover the costs of all this care? I, I appreciate my unemployment. <laughs> I appreciate Urban League and all of the other community um, 
supports that we can actually reach out to. I have my own household, my own husband, my own child that I've ignored Mm -hmm. since my dad has been home. Um, But actually, on the flip side, the furlough is probably a blessing. I would not be able to care for my dad at this level and support him if I was working a full-time job. That's a really good point. I mean, just being able to have that time to devote to him, that's that's such a gift. And and he definitely needs it. I, I, I need my job and I want my job back immediately, but <laughs> but I guess in due time. <laughs> What's the latest on that? I mean, is there any hope that you'll be rehired sometime soon to that position? It's uh they haven't given us any clear direction yet when we were furloughed. Back in May, they said that it would be a temporary furlough for up for at least eight weeks. So we've already surpassed the eight weeks. Hmm. So now I'm just hoping for a call come October. I think I'll be ready in October to let my dad go and become more independent and not dependent. (laughs) So as you said, though, in the meantime, he does need the help. You mentioned being there 62 hours a week with a family of your own. I'm sure you would not choose to take on that many hours if you didn't have to. What are some of the things that he's been dealing with health-wise? Well, dad is has he has a lot of residual pain mm-hmm. and it's 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 that ghost type of pain um, that you might hear somebody who loses a limb speak of um, uh, just residual pain from his back that radiates down his legs or his knee hurts really, really bad to where it's just debil- debilitating mm-hmm. and he wants to lay down all day. But with that condition the virus still has a lot of mucus in his body and he needs to be elevated at least 75 percent of the way but with all the pain he only wants to lay Mm. so that's that's really really difficult his stomach with the feeding tube the nutritional shakes that he's receiving and all of the pain meds man it just takes a toll on his stomach as well so there's so much residual pain and and sounds like he's still on a lot of medication. Is that correct? Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. A lot of medication. And what about his mental health? There's been a lot of reports about how ventilator use and, and being that seriously ill um, with COVID-19, it, it seems to do things to people where it's it's harder to come back from that. Is that something he's been struggling with? I would say for him, uh, he tries not to show it, but with me being there and knowing him, um, being a very lively person, very talkative person, very outgoing, Mm -hmm. and not being able to have visitors, uh, that's difficult for him. I have to tell him no often. No, do not invite that person over. <laughs> and, and it is uh, not safe. <laughs> and why are you limiting visitors? Are you afraid that he could catch this again? Absolutely, because the medical reports have not shown clear yes or no whether or not he can contract the virus again. Hmm. Has he had any problems with things like dementia? I know that's also been linked to some of these longer term cases. Um, I'll say for his memory, it's still fairly sharp. Mm. Um, the only thing that he has an issue with is forgetfulness. But I have that problem, too. You think you, you're going to go into the kitchen and get something and you forget why you went in there. Uh, so he has that issue. That. Yes. <laughs> so, but I have that, too. So. <laughs> So I'm not sure if that's really a medical problem at the moment. <laughs> well, that's good to know that, that he's not suffering from anything more serious on that front. But, but for you, Melanie, I mean, this is just a lot to deal with. I mean, again, 60 hours a week, 62 hours a week, that is a lot. And being a caregiver when you're not used to yes. being a caregiver, that's that's hard. I mean, yes. how are you doing yes. personally? Well, uh, I'll say Total Wine has become my new friend, and I'll probably need AA by the time this is all over with. But I'm hoping for the best. (laughs) So you're taking a bright outlook there, doing a little (laughs) self-medication. Absolutely. (laughs) Self-care. That's very important. So look, I mean, your family has been through so much on this, and this has been such a long struggle. What would you want people to know who haven't had to deal with COVID-19 personally, haven't gone through this ordeal? What would you want them to know about your family's experience? I'll say the most frustrating thing for me when I'm in public and listening to the news, all of the individuals who are refusing to wear masks. Mm -hmm. And, And my thing with that is 
Even if it works or if it doesn't work, people seem to believe that it will work. And I just ask, just wear a mask because there are so many asymptomatic people uh, walking around that do not have any symptoms that can pass on the virus to another person. Please just wear your mask. I, I don't think it's much to ask it, it just to wear a mask. Um, but definitely if you have someone that is fighting the virus, you have to keep them motivated in order to keep them safe and yourself safe. Yeah, to, to sort of keep their head in the game, even when it feels like it's impossible. Any tips on how to do that to keep someone motivated in the middle of a battle like this? You know, it, it's a you take like I tell my dad, I said, we're taking one moment at a time, not one day, just one moment at a time, because things for him can change as well as things for me could change at any moment. So one moment at a time, if this is a good moment, we're going to cherish it. And what are we doing right now at this moment that we can pass on to the next moment? Well, Melanie Blackshear, it's been remarkable to hear your story. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I thank you for having me. And best of luck to you and your dad. I know he's still on that road to recovery, but it's great to hear that he's just continuing to improve day to day, moment to moment. Absolutely. It's a blessing. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.